Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the life of John Nelson Darby and the theology of the rapture. My guest is my good friend James Tunney, author of The Mystical Accord, Sutras to Suit Our Times, Lines for Spiritual Evolution, as well as The Mystery of the Trapped Light, Mystical Thoughts in the Dark Age of Scientism. He's also written several books on the disquieting influence of scientism, as well as two dystopian novels, Blue Lies September and Ireland. I don't recognize who she is. James lives in Gothenburg, Sweden, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, James. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Uh, it's great to see you, although when I was thinking about our last interview and you said that I banged on for 10 minutes, I, I was a bit disappointed that it was so short. <laughs> well, uh, you can bang on for longer than 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the conversation as always. You know, there's two ways to look at this conversation. Uh, my main interest is in the theological concept of the rapture, but another angle that we'll be discussing is the person of John Nelson Darby, who was sort of the originator of that theology, and I know you're very fond of talking about Irishmen, and uh, I gather he was at least an Anglo-Irishman. It's very important because we don't really have the rapture without John uh, Nelson Darby. So he's a, he's a critical part of the story. And yes, uh, he's Anglo-Irish. So he's actually born in London in 1800. His middle name, Nelson, gives it away. because they have a, The family have associations with Admirable, uh, Admiral Lord Nelson. So he's very much, he, he, sometimes he's painted as, as a, a figure from the margins sometimes, but he's really from the aristocracy, from the ascendancy, and from a, an Anglo-Irish family that had a castle in Ireland, Leap Castle, or I think it's pronounced Lep Castle in Offaly. So they were involved in the power structure that controlled Ireland. So when we're talking about the Anglo-Irish class, as we've talked about before, we're talking about the ascendancy that d derived from the Norman colonization going back to 1169. And, and, and it's, it's quite amazing in that context, Geoffrey, just one point. When the Normans came to Ireland in 1169, a number of them had been to Jerusalem. And people don't understand that. So Ireland is often seen as one of the first modern colonial experiments. But at the same time, they had this great experiment uh, in, with the kingdom of Jerusalem and the crusader states and this was in, involved a lot of Norman families as well. So some of these people that came to Ireland had co direct connections with Jerusalem and saw it as their own. And this is a theme which comes through the, through, through the, um, the points we may discuss about Jerusalem. And the, so he's born into this uh, landed gentry. He, he comes to Ireland uh, when he's 15 for uh, full time, if you like. And he comes to study because people used to study a, a, at a lot younger age. So he starts at Trinity College, where I started, uh, but he started at age 15 and he studied classics. And he also enrolled at the King's Inn, where I also studied. And he would have been in the same building that I went to study there. It was a modern uh, well, building which ha had been built in the early 1800s. But the King's Inn had been set up, the Honourable Society had been set up by King Henry VIII. And King Henry VIII is really the founder as well of the, the Anglican Church. So the, he's part of the Church of Ireland, which is the Irish version of the Anglican Church. And after 1800, they were united. And he, he studies uh, the classics and he studies, he dines at the King's Inn. When you're training to be a barrister, you still have to go in with your gowns and dine a certain amount of time, times with other lawyers and judges. 
And then he goes to Lincoln's Inn in, uh, in London. So just as I did, funny enough. So his, his educational background is a bit, a bit similar. So I, I share that with him. So he, he, be, he, he starts off in law, but he, he, he doesn't. He, then he shifts. He changes direction. And he, he, he goes uh, into the priesthood as a Church of Ireland, uh, a Church of Ireland um, pastor, preacher, minister, uh, and uh, or priest. And it's important to remember that the, they were an established church in Ireland. So everybody, even if you were Jewish, Jeffrey, would have had to pay a, a tithe uh, from their, 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 if you owned land to the, to the upkeep of the established church. So you can imagine there was a lot of animosity from poor people who were forced uh, at that stage to rely on potatoes. Remember, potatoes was an imported crop. Uh, it wasn't an indigenous to Ireland. And that was because... They, the uh, Catholics were uh, were on, living on marginal land, and also at this time, uh, when he's born, they still have what are called the penal laws, which prohibited Catholics from uh, holding most offices. And in, in fact, to be a barrister at the at the time, you had to take an oath against popery. So uh, that that that's a context, a very powerful context. So sometimes he's he's portrayed as an itinerant preacher, uh, aesthetic, he did those things, but it's not a full story. Maybe you could fill me in a little more on the background of the uh, Irish church, because uh, I, I'm not really all that familiar. I know today Ireland is largely a Catholic country, and, uh, and yet at one time what you're telling me, the, the established church was a branch of the Anglican church. Yes, because um, remember, when, when the Normans came to Ireland, they were coming to what was formerly the land of saints and scholars. So they were, uh, as we talked about before, with all the, the great history of Christianity. So they were, they were Catholics as well, but they saw the people in Ireland as animals, if you like, in many senses. That, that's in the Chronicles. Uh, they, they didn't see them as their equals. So there was an extra element to it. So, so it wasn't really about... Uh, about religion. It was about a Norman imperial system. So then, of course, when we had the Reformation, the indigenous Irish native people were, uh, were had, had a second, uh, there was a second division there. Either they, they, they took oaths of supremacy towards the state and towards the king and Henry VIII, uh, there was acts uh, of supremacy. Either you took an oath to the king and you, you gave up your connection to the Catholic Church or you were excluded. And then there was laws to exclude Catholics. So we had this imperial system and then we had the Protestant system. And the Protestant system was identified with the landholding class. So it was the minority at the top. So the, the, the Catholics, there was in, in fact a, a reaction as well. So the Catholic Church wasn't the oppressor in this context. And it was a unifying force for the dispossessed. Um, and so, therefore, the, there was a lot of hostility towards uh, his class. And as well as that, at the time, uh, if we think back of our talk on William Blake, we know after the French Revolution, there's a great period of chaos. And, and especially in Protestantism, there was a lot of looking around for, for different ideas. So what we ha ha there was a lot of discontent with the Anglican Church. So we had a lot of other uh, denominations which, which sprung up. And in particular in the 1830s, it's remarkable that in Britain and the United States, we had a whole range of organizations from the, from the Mormons, with Joseph Smith, the Adventists, the Millerites, uh, the Irvingites in, 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 in Britain. For example, the Irvingites were where the, the, the practice of glossolalia came from. And the, there were, so they were seeking for other ideas because there was, there was discontent in the established church. And in fact, the reason why, so, so after his legal career, he uh, becomes a preacher and then he gets into a dispute with the local bishop because the local bishop, uh, there was a campaign to convert Catholics and it, was, it seemed to be going quite well. The population uh, uh, before the famine in Ireland uh, what, what was growing quite uh, quickly and there was conversions happening and he was out in the Wicklow Hills going around to doing uh, his evangelizing and, and uh, proselytizing and converting people. And then the bishop said, 
that in order to come into the church, you had to take an oath to the to the king. Now, this was something you know the 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 the, the, the people in Ireland would have gone to hell rather than than done that. So that that stopped this uh, conversion, and and then that led to uh, Derby having a bit of a crisis, that particular uh, dispute, and he he. He had an accident with a horse, and this is a period, a thing which happens in a lot, as you know, in a lot of people's lives, a period of convalescence where he, he looks at the world uh, again. And out of that period of convalescence, he develops his, his particular notions of ecclesiology or the notion of what a church should be. And he rejects this connection between this church and state. And now, I, I admire that aspect of, of his belief that there's once... And, and this is this is an important issue for Protestantism. Although they reject the Catholic Church, there were many denominations that were very closely af- uh, affiliated with power uh, and uh, involved in the power structure and involved in the imperial structure. So he rejects this uh, connection and he, he begins to associate with other uh, people uh, uh, in, in Dublin. And from there... Uh, emerges in the late 1820s a group which were called the Brethren. So the Brethren were a new uh, simplified um, uh, group outside the the Church of Ireland and from that group meeting in Dublin it subsequently grew up into what's known as the Plymouth Brethren and the Exclusive Brethren. So he was involved at the start of that. He was one of the founders in, in, in that movement. So the Plymouth Brethren is a bit of a misnomer. It could have been called the Dublin Brethren or the Wicklow Brethren. So he's in par- he's in, involved in, in that. Uh, so he's moving away from that. But in, in many, whether he's moving away from the whole apparatus, we can't say that because, uh, uh, as, as we'll be seeing. Well, I gather the very name, the Brethren, suggests that uh, it's it's sort of an egalitarian uh, organization that you you don't have priests and uh, other church officials who are re- responsible for saving their flock. They, the the notion of the brethren is that they they come together as equals. That any member of the congregation is capable of uh, speaking or receiving uh, information from God. Yes, uh, that that's a very a very good description of it. I mean, it's very admirable in many ways. the The idea was they come together and they break bread, and it would be a kind of spiritual community moving away from denominations. So it's 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 an idea that uh, I think is, is very important. And he saw that the church was in ruins, and it's very admirable. His ecclesiology, his theory of how, if you like, the church assembles or the organization of people assembles is, 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 is profound in some ways. Although the counter argument is that the Plymouth Brethren and his version, which split off called the Exclusive Brethren, were a very cultish, uh, in relation to the Exclusive Brethren, they're often described as a cult, moving from a, a sect to a cult uh, uh, associated with him. So it reminds me in some ways, and now people mightn't like the analogy, but of the organizational structure of, say, uh, Trotskyism or some other, some other form of ideology which is associated with, with, you know, where you get people who are very dedicated, but it needs that kind of charisma behind it. So although it was a, a church which was not a church, it transformed into something which kind of looked like a church. But yes, no priests, simplicity. Uh, no one in charge, although women had a, a, a kind of inferior position in, uh, reflecting the social status that the, at, at, uh, in, in, in some senses, well, in many senses, and it was kind of very conservative. And also later, they began to remove themselves or, or not want to be connected with society in some way. So um, there, there, there are good points in the ecclesiology, but what emerged from that is quite distinct and quite unique. Now, I hadn't really heard of John Nelson Darby prior to our earlier conversation about him. Uh, However, now I gather he wrote uh, maybe 30 volumes of his theological writings and has had a huge influence on uh, the Protestant movement, particularly in the United States. It's quite remarkable. Uh, if you asked many Irish people, they would have never heard of him. Uh, he's not well known. 
Uh, and uh, I mean, the influence, as we know, we've talked about before about Ireland and, and the United States. People forget that there's over 20 presidents of Ulster Scots, Protestant uh, background, uh, before, you know, uh, as well. So there's a profound connection. But his influence is remarkable. It really is remarkable. Um, and the, the direct connection happened through the evolution of his eschatology, which we can talk a bit more about, and, and his idea of the end times. And this was taken uh, so, so by himself in some sense, because he visited the United States about seven times from the 1860s to the 1870s, uh, when uh, the United States was going through uh, upheaval, and when also people in the South were losing faith in their existing systems as it was destroyed. There was a lot of flux, uh, and he was involved in conferences and, and making connections over there that led to the streams which uh, of, of fundamentalism or evangelicalism. And in particular, he is the one who is seen to be the father of dispensationalism. Now, a lot of people don't know what that is, uh, dispensationalism, but in in, in the last few decades, or well, it goes back to the 70s, it became extremely popular uh, in, in the public media. Uh, if we think of, the, the, there was a, uh, like A Thief in the Night was, was one film, which led to a, a series of books later on, Left Behind, and a television series. They, 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 they were very, extremely popular. And The Late Great Planet Earth was another series by Hal Lindsey. So... Uh, this Tim LaHaye series and, and the Jenkins uh, books left behind were very, very popular and there was remakes of those films. So what those films do and the books is they represent a what's going to happen with the rapture. And the rapture goes back to uh, John Nelson Darby and in particular his idea of pre-millennium millennial dispensationalism that's his his key idea that's the key idea of his eschatology the doctrine of end times so uh, he is responsible and that that's a philosophy which we can find in some way related to people like jerry falwell and some degree in, in pat robertson there and billy graham uh, it's 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 taken in some form by uh, president bush Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter, it's unbelievable. His influence has been uh, direct. And also, it's been fundamentally important in the evolution of Christian Zionism. So the preoccupation with Israel, in many senses, goes back to John Nelson Darby. That's a huge, a huge and consistent influence. And it circles back to a direct influence, back to one of the preoccupations uh, with Jerusalem, yeah. Well, you know, I've done a few interviews now with Charles Upton, who has written some 20 books on religious traditionalism. And, and one of the points that he makes is that you can look at Hinduism or the ancient Greeks, and they all talk about different ages of humanity, the Silver Age, the Golden Age. The, and, and many of these traditions suggest we're in a dark age right now. The Kali Yuga, for example, uh, he equates the, uh, I think he equates the idea of the Kali Yuga with this Christian idea idea of the end of days. John Nelson's Darby uh, contribution and dispensationalism was to look at the Bible and look at present times and say, well, actually, there are different dispensations. There are different times in the Bible. There are different epochs, economies or ways that God interacted uh, with the earth and, in and with, with mankind. And in particular, there was usually a pattern of uh, of starting in a positive way and failing miserably, you know, with the flood or with Adam. So there's this recurrent failure of humankind to live up to God's uh, expectations. And when Jesus came, he was he was killed, and that started off. He was crucified, and that started off an, another era. But this, the real one, is com uh, is common now uh, in many senses. So so those dispensations, in many senses, yes are not new. His were quite unique. And actually, you can see the dispensations uh, continue. You can see it in 
to some extent, and he, Darby talked about Aeons, as did A.E. Russell. We can see the same thing in Alistair Crowley. And another person who's not linked to this discourse, but I think there is a connection, is, is Carl Jung. So when I was looking at some of the background to Nelson Darby, some of the ideas of how time was organized prefigure uh, what Jung talks about. So there is some connection with his Protestant background. And also, Darby went to Switzerland for about five years. Not only did he go to the United States, but he went to Switzerland, Australia, uh, New Zealand, the West Indies. He, he, he was really uh, peripatetic. He traveled around uh, proselytizing. But one key, one key part of the dispensational idea was that there was a split, there was a separate, uh, there was a separate uh, system for Israel and the church and that the Bible was divided between certain passages which were meant for the Jews and certain passages were, which were meant for, for the, the others, for the Gentiles. Now this is a very strange uh, division of the Bible and it leads to very strange results for example where dispensationists won't say the, the Our Father or they'll say the Sermon on the Mount is not directed at them is directed against the Jews. So a lot of the central bit of Christianity is taken out. It's, it's a, for me, it's a very unconvincing argument. And it's not just for me. Well, if say you're not a biblical scholar, uh, there's plenty of biblical scholars think that there is no basis for this. Not so much the dispensations, but what he began to extract from that. He used that as a foundation for his, his particular description of, of the rapture. So you can read, for example, Barbara Ruining has written a book called The Rapture Exposed, and there are books which argue that it's a hoax. The, 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 it was a, seen as by many theologians, and, and these are, or Barbara Ruining is a Lutheran, so she's not a critic of Protestantism in, in that sense. She's a critic of this particular doctrine. She believes that it's very dangerous because it leads to a situation that... The, the dispensationists see the world as evil. They see they're creating a self-fulfilling prophecy and they're happy to, to, to drive forward towards the end of time. This, this is a, a problem uh, with the doctrine. So, yes, that, that's recurrent, that dispensationalism. But it's where he drew, in particular, this distinction. And from that distinction comes this American, U.S. foreign policy, uh, its intervention in the uh, in Israel and in the Middle East. So it is, in my view, it is utilized to mobilize a constituency who per per persuaded by this. And I would point out that um, if you look at the origin of the timing of uh, John, uh, the origin of dispensationism with Derby, it was at a time when the British Empire was becoming very interested uh, in uh, continuing with its long involvement in the former crusader states because uh, as well as the, the cross of Christianity, Jerusalem is a crossroads and it was necessary for the British Empire to to balance the power of Russia. This was one, one of the uh, important points. So there is a long a long-standing interest of the British Empire uh, in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, in Solomon's Temple, which is also an, es uh, an esoteric connection the basis for the Knights Templar, the Knights of St. John, and this has been very important behind the scenes for many of the operatives in, in, in geopolitics. So, um, yes, dispensationalism, dispensations are there, those arguments are, are, are there. And it, it, to finish off, Jeff, sorry, uh, the, I would argue that there's a kind of archetypal nature to it, that a lot of these predictions are recognizing that there are archetypal cycles as opposed to some deterministic apocalyptic uh, cycle. And that's one of the problems of these, this type of thinking, that there are kind of archetypal recurrences which are valid because these things happen. If you predict that we're going to have war, famine, or hunger, violence, you can't go wrong, Jeff. It's going to, it's going to happen. So they may look great prophecies, but it's really the unfortunate recurrence of humans in their unevolved spiritual state, in my view. To my understanding, 
Christians have believed at least for a thousand years, probably including actually right up to the time of Jesus, that the world was about to end in their lifetime. I, I think there are people who feel that that's exactly what Jesus himself taught. Yes, that's true. And uh, there, there, are two, there are two schools or a number of schools on that. One is a kind of historicist school, which looks at the context that Jesus was talking about in relation to the empire and relation to the uh, what was going to happen to the Jews, what was going to ha foreseeing what was going to happen to the temple and the fall of the temple. And in many senses, there is, people see uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel or the revelations associated with John, um, which were done about 90 AD, as related to the particular context. Uh, and from that particular context, there may be what I would say the, the archetypal, the recurrent aspect of it. So uh, in, in many ways, I mean, I would make the argument that uh, the recurrent element may be a clash between empire and spir spirituality. And uh, these things are going to recur. And in many senses, as the imperial method it was is evolving over hundreds of years and over centuries that it has to come to this conflict ultimately between the nature of being human uh, in that sense so yes it's a recurrent uh, phenomenon the only difference is of course that uh, <laughs> the only difference is that never before have we had the capacity to apply technology the appliance of science in order to achieve this literally to achieve the end of times and in my sense the end of times refers to the end of the nature of, of human spirituality so it's recurrent it's always going to be there because there is this force uh, in humanity even when we, we we have such great technological control so it is recurrent but it's the difference with john nelson darby and the rapture is it's a very particular example of what's going to happen a very particular description that millions of people in america believe is going to happen in that particular way so perhaps we have to elaborate on that well let's talk about the details what exactly did john nelson darby mean when he used that phrase the rapture one thing that uh, uh, in relation to the particular word that doesn't come up for me when, I, when I'm looking at what the, the biblical scholars say is they don't contextualize it in the terms of uh, too much uh, in what I've seen, I'm sure it's there, in relation to the stream of romanticism. There is some, uh, some awareness of it, but the word rapture was used uh, in relation by a lot of the romantics. It was the sublime state that Edmund Burke talked about. This was the essence of romanticism, which, which he critiqued. The, the seeking for an elevated state, a state of all bliss, sublime. So in many senses, and I, I looked at uh, Google Ngram in relation to the frequency of the, of the use of the word. So, of course, it goes like this, uh, up very high in, in the 70s and 80s, uh, like, like a big mountain. But it was quite high just before, um, just before Nelson Darby began to write about it. So it was in the zeitgeist. And it would have come up in romantic literature. So who doesn't want to be enraptured? Who doesn't want rapture? So in many senses, it's a great paradox because in a lot of the um, dour kind of religious practices, the great promise is you're going to have this fantastic rapture. What is the rapture? The rapture is a secret rapture. So secrets, that's great as well, Jeffrey. You can't go wrong with a bit of secrecy because you can sell books called a secret. So if you have a secret rapture, that's fantastic. So it's, it reflects a certain idea as well, a pre-existing idea in Protestantism about certain people being predestined or elected to, to go to the next stage. So what's going to happen? Uh, there will be certain signs and then uh, Jesus will descend from the clouds. So there's various descriptions. Uh, there'll be trumpets. Uh, there's different descriptions depending on which piece. But it's it's secret. It's going to happen. Uh, it's going to happen suddenly, and you will be with uh, one of uh, one of the the chosen ones, perhaps. And they're just going to disappear, Jeffrey. That's what's going to happen. This is the the, the story. So in the in the the the, the films made uh, for the example they use in in, in a couple of the films is that all of a sudden, on a flight, 
people disappear, that their passengers, some of the passengers disappear, only the chosen ones, the ones who have followed and believed by faith alone uh, in, in the scripture that is told to them uh, by people like John Nelson Darby and reading from the Schofield Bible, the, the most one of the most famous Protestant Bibles, which was annotated or based on John Nelson Darby's uh, dispensation ideas. If you follow that and listen to the uh, the evangelist and the television, and, and, and so, so, so then you'll be okay. And what will happen is you will be taken up into heaven, and the people on earth will suffer a great tribulation for seven years, which will involve the Antichrist uh, assuming power. And he's going to assume power and probably be based in in Jerusalem. Now, now not all of this uh, later bits come comes from John Nelson Darby, but the the idea is is there of a secret rapture, uh, the people being taken up uh, in into the in the clouds off the earth, uh, and then we have a seven year period, which precedes the return of, of Jesus with the saints uh, and the christian dead who have been elevated with the people who are alive to come back to fight with armageddon against the antichrist and then we have the millennial period the thousand years of rule and that will probably be in, Jer in jerusalem so the the idea is that it's necessary for uh, israel to be established for these things to happen and that's why they wanted to happen uh, so that that's a that's a difficult bit but the key aspect is you're driving along in your car, and then you disappear up in, into the uh, you disappear up into uh, he heaven. So this is, or into whatever st uh, state. There's different variations. Now the, the key thing for a lot of scholars, you can get bits. Everyone seems to agree on the second coming, which is really at the end of time. But this is a a, a premillennial rapture. So it comes before. Uh, the tribulation, so that you don't suffer the tribulation. So this is a great deal. So I can, we guarantee you, Jeffrey, that you're not going to suffer this great tribulation. You'll be up there. Uh, you'll avoid all this. And in many ways, it may reflect the fact that uh, this comes, a lot of it came, was expressed in a number of conferences called the Powers Court Conferences. Powers Court is a house, uh, a big house in, in County Wicklow. And they had a series of conferences there, which went on for a few years, but 1831 and 1833 was was particularly important, and this is where John Nelson Darby, with other uh, other group of thinkers, of Protestant thinkers, and the brethren, he began to express this idea of the rapture there. And some of the Church of Ireland, in fact, began to leave that because they knew that it wasn't it wasn't uh, it wasn't true. And in some senses. It's a bit of the elect going up in the, only the Dublin Hills, but going up in the higher ground, removed from the ordinary people, you know, elected, uh, going to avo avoid the suffering, as they would have done during the famine, for example. It's a in some senses, it's very related to the class which it comes from. And, and the danger of it then is that you just focus on that. So you can abandon all this stuff through that selective reading of the Bible. You can abandon all those things about loving your neighbor and, and about the force, uh, the, the Jesus force in reality. It becomes, it's claimed to be very literalistic. The hermeneutics of this eschatology, the system of interpretation, uh, is claimed to be very literal. But it's literally not in the Bible, so the description of a literal interpretation is not true. It's selective literalism. So it's a mosaic, not in the sense of Moses, but it's a mosaic patterning of pieces from different sources, which sounds very convincing when you hear it, because you start off and you hear, well, in first uh, letter for, to the Corinthians or Te Thessalonians or the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation, and you, you get a whole chapter and verse and in, in some senses, it's really like biblical scientism. There was also a, a pretension to science in this. It's a scientism. It's in, in many senses, it's not real biblical stuff. It's a composite, and it serves a very useful purpose. And it's there, in, in, in my view, it has a very negative effect in relation to the susceptibility of large groups towards manipulation to achieve goals which are not related in any sense towards the, the original. Well, it sounds as if 
you're suggesting that Darby, who came from a very privileged elite ruling class background, sort of transferred the that implicit ideology into a theology. I, I think there's some connection. I, I don't think you can ignore that. I think if you look at this idea of predestination and the elect and some variants of that, you do have a sense of the chosen people. And this is the chosen people. Now, now this is important because they can accept that the, the Jews are the chosen people. But there's another group that you have to remember, and this is the group that ran the British Empire. Now, they regarded themselves as their chosen people. And in fact, a lot of people don't understand that there were groups like the British Israelites. And they believed, and this had implications up, up to the present day, uh, Jeffrey, they believe that they are one of the lost tribes of, of, of Israel. It's, it sounds quite absurd in many senses, but this is a very powerful belief and they can trace particular things. That's why between 1899 and 1902, the hill of Tara was dug up by the British Israelites looking for the Ark of the Covenant. It's quite incredible. It's, it's quite an incredible story. So this fascination with Jerusalem goes on and on. And of course, Solomon's Temple, the Knights Templar, and Freemasonry, it's all there, this connection. So to a certain extent, there's a deeper, there's a deeper connection. Esoteric, mystical, ideological, whatever, is that some groups believe, we know that there's fighting between Christians, Jews, and, and Muslims to control the Temple Mount. But some of these groups believe that they're actually the inheritors of Solomon's Temple, of this source. And in many ways, that's the center of the world, that Jerusalem is the navel of the world. It's the central point, And control of that ultimately goes with the uh, effort to establish uh, a wider uh, empire. So it's, it's, it's quite amazing. So there's no doubt of that connection. And the only strange paradox is that the idea has become so popular that there's so many millions of of American uh, people, and now in South America, this this is a funny connection, Be, with the gro growth of liberation theology that a lot of people support uh, in in South America, the Catholic Church has declined in many senses, and, and this type of evangelical uh, belief is taking over. So there's a direct uh, uh, connection between. So 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 this is growing uh, in South America. So it's becoming it's replacing the what had been the, the, the vernacular popular popular religion. So uh, it is in that source. And, and I, my warning to, to people from there is that um, if you look at its use in foreign policy and in, in geopolitics, I think that that uh, elect element is, is still there. And that in many senses, when if you buy this, if you believe that you may genuinely believe, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I don't denigrate or say anything wrong about anyone that, that believes in, in that stuff. But if you believe it without looking at the history of it and not being open to the possibility that you are being manipulated by the same class that have been the same uh, Norman class, if you like, that's power structures that has globalized the Anglo sphere that Churchill talked about, the Atlanticist uh, sphere that these forces are very, very useful and they have been utilized to justify intervention in Iraq, uh, in Israel, Lebanon, all across the Middle East. They've been able to mobilize by saying, here it is now, this is the end of time. And part of this story is as well that Russia will invade Israel. This is a, 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 a that comes out of the argument. So of course, now we have the end time. So Unfortunately, there's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. There's a kind of recklessness about it. There's a game of chicken going to the driving the car to the edge of the cliff. So the unfortunate thing is that you'll be able to utilize the fear you have you have uh, inculcated in people with the possibility of a great joy if this horrible situation happens. So it drives people. Uh, you get a bit concerned when you have a a dispensationalist president in the United States, because in many senses, Carter talked, called that some of these issues were the unfolding of biblical prophecy, as did Bush. So you get worried that they might want to help on the process, because if they believe that the end of times is good, this is the whole, this is the whole problem. The end of times is not bad for this group.
So you get this self-fulfilling prophecy. So yes, there's definitely a connection. And I understand that there are groups, uh, small Jewish sects, that uh, are very interested in the idea of the restoration of the Temple of Solomon, and which includes the restoration of the ancient rituals of animal sacrifice. And there, there are Jewish people preparing to start those rituals up again, and uh, I guess with support from various Christian fundamentalist denominations. Oh, there's no question. This is, this is part of it, and, and the, the search for the red heifer, and, and the, uh, yes, that's part of it. It's a very strange element of it that this sacrifice would be uh, reinstituted and uh, the uh, going with Nelson Darby's idea, well, this is something about the Jews, because the Jews are still the chosen people. The Gentiles for 2,000 of years were just an aberration, an exception, uh, until the Jews are restored, although they have a great tribulation. During that seven-year period, two-thirds of them could be destroyed, according to some of these descriptions, until they convert to Christianity. So you have to bear in mind that some of these groups are nudged, supported as well, by some of the views behind the scenes from, from a Christian perspective. So that's right, and it's very curious, and you, and you begin to ask yourself, well, how does that tie into Christianity? Well, in, in, and Jung, has, uh, uh, Jung believed that the, the Catholic Mass, the traditional Mass, was one of the greatest psychological achievements, that it was rich, and he, he wrote fantastically about that. But in many senses, the idea of Jesus as a sacrifice was a replacement for uh, previous sacrifices, a literal kind of a change in that direction. Um, so the idea that Christianity is supporting a return to the, uh, the pre-existing situation, again, is another thing that, that strikes me as something inconsistent with Christianity. And you have to ask yourself, well, really, is this some other game behind the scene? And the intervention uh, of uh, Lord Shaftesbury and others in wanting to intervene in Israel in the mid-19th century was part of the great game, as, as, they, called, uh, as they called it. So uh, my fear is about the manipulation of religious groups for certain purposes. And then when you talk or you listen to uh, very traditional uh, Jews. They don't. They don't have this view. They, 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 that it's not consistent with many of the really traditional Jewish uh, sects, if you like, because they don't see that. They believe that uh, history happened in a particular way, and many of these are presented as, as as Jewish ideas. I'm not saying anything about the particular people that want to uh, to do that, but it seems it seems like a very strange uh, idea. And I would look to. Uh, the Christian influence on, on Zionism. I'm not talking about establishing uh, a homeland for the Jewish people or anything. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about other esoteric foreign policy, inter ideological interventions, manipulations that compromise the situation and make, it, uh, and make it worse. For example, the according to a lot of the theories, they interpret, which is not in the Bible, but they interpret the seven-year period and the tribulation has been associated with a peace treaty. So the consequence of that seems to be that you're not going to get a peace treaty, or if you do get a peace treaty, it will be seen to be the end of the world. So uh, it seems like a very strange interpretation, not justified by the text. And I have looked, looked at all the, 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 the textual basis in, in the Bible that they talk about. It's just not there, in my view. There are elements in Matthew and in, in those letters, Corinthians and all that, that, that have elements you know, disappear in the, or, or Christ will come in the twinkling of an eye and those, those ideas, thief in the night. But they're really stretched uh, certain bits are ignored, inconsistencies are ignored, uh, and so that's very much a, a part of it. And there are some very, uh, very sensible scholars that believe that this fascination with the end times will bring the end times because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Whether it be from the uh, whatever es eschatology, that fascination with the end times. Well, I'm under the impression that. Probably the biggest criticism of this theology is uh, what it's doing to the planet as a whole. I recall 
And during the Ronald Reagan years, Earl Butts was the Secretary of Agriculture, and he made, as, as I remember, a famous statement saying, we don't have to worry about environmental degradation, uh, you know, putting poisonous chemicals into the environment and so on, because the world's going to end soon anyway. That's right. I remember another uh, ch chap who said that from the Reagan administration, uh, and th uh, that's correct. And that's true, because if you believe that uh, the Earth is, is merely a precursor to the rapture, towards your individual salvation, you don't have to care about really other people in, in, in many senses. Well, you, you know, you can, you can bring people along, but and I, I'm not denigrating the, the, the work of, or, or, or the industry or the belief of John Nelson Darby. I'm not saying, they, 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 he dedicated his life to this, and he wrote this various uh, description, 34, 36, 54 volumes, 5 million words of stuff on this, on, on his theology. So uh, he's very serious. But the critique of people like certain Lutherans and Baptists is that this leads to a lack of stewardship of the earth, that it's all going to be destroyed. What's the point? And I think that's a disaster, a disastrous element. So I, I, I agree. I think uh, on a more basic level, there's the question of, well, what is the impact in a pragmatic sense of this spiritual theology? What does it mean in relation to how we interact with people? And there was some influence in even in Northern Ireland, Jeff, because some of the, the people um, on, the, on the Protestant side had connections with the United States, and they had a certain, uh, they inherited a bit of this apocalyptic uh, viewpoint. And it came into their language when they were discussing these issues. They saw the Babylon, they saw the Pope as the Antichrist, they saw, you know, all, all the, there's been a lot of Antichrists in, in history, if you look back, and there's been a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of organizations. There was a book by Selma Lagerlöf, the, who won the Nobel Prize, the, 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 the Swedish writer, and she wrote a book called Jerusalem about a group of Swedish people that went to Jerusalem because they believed the second coming was going to happen. And then we had the Germans that went to Jerusalem because the second coming was going to happen. So there's, uh, the, so that was direct consequences in, 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 in the community. So this, this second coming is, it has been it has been prophesized many times the great disappointment with the Millerites in 1844 it's 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 like have you've talked about that when prophecies fail this has been recurrent uh, unlike funny enough in Fatima where Fatima where the the event the event uh, occurred another interesting connection on that is that sister Lucia was asked in an interview in 1957 whether our Lady had said that this was the end of times, and she said she didn't say that, but she interpreted it as being the end of times. So, funnily enough, in Catholicism, if you look at uh, Fatima and also Garabandal in, in Spain uh, in, in the 60s, this idea of a catastrophe uh, is there as well. So, the, they kind of go together, and Malachi Martin would have looked to the book of Revelations. He believed that the third secret was related. So, the, the problem is that there are so many issues going on, we can't dismiss the underlying issues, but my problem is they're not, not looking at the right issues. For example, they say, a lot of them say, oh, well, it's the United Nations is the problem. Well, the United Nations doesn't have power in these. Of all the organizations you're going to pick, the United Nations is not the dangerous one. They don't focus actually on the ones which are really military, the, the military industrial complex. So they're very selective about who they pick out. They don't really go marching on the weapons manufacturers because they see that as part of, of the overall scheme. So, yes, it's very bad for the earth. It's very bad for foreign policy. And there's a, there's a, there's a cruel element to it. The idea that you can go on a kind of crusade, uh, uh, go on a, a mission, intervene in a country with a vague sense of, uh, well, a strong sense of righteousness, a vague sense of strategy, in order to uh, fill out God's plan while you're murdering people by the millions. It's, it's an unbelievable disjuncture. It's, it's inconsistent with Christianity for me. And, and funny enough, most of those, some of those groups that are very uh, narrow would regard all other Christians as not being Christians. In fact, they regard people near them as antichrists. And they say that about people that are very close, that have little uh, differences in doctrines. So uh, I'm against 
it because it's, it, it leads people to be manipulated, to support foreign policy, which effectively leads people with blood on their hands and, and not directly, but that you can't support interventionist foreign policies which lead to, 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 to deaths of thousands and, and not accept some responsibility, unless you have said, this law doesn't apply to me, which is what happens. There's an antinomian aspect. We don't have to pay attention to those rules. We only have to focus on this. So it's it's a great, the rapture is a great distraction in many senses. And I know a lot of people who would find that, who believe in that, would find that, uh, would disagree with that and, and strongly oppose that and, and reject that. But if you look at the hi- history and look at what has happened and look at the connection between certain religious views and uh, certain Christian views, certain, uh, in this con- context, Protestant views, it has been devastating and it has been associated with power. And this is a conflict within Protestantism uh, of proximity to power. And it's actually the thing that John Nelson Darby started off with, criticizing the connection between church and state. So whether he would support where his doctrines have gone is another issue. He, he was probably too deep to, to have those things uh, as, uh, projected on him. So I'm not putting all the blame on him. Uh, I, I think it has been manipulated and utilized for short-term strategic purposes by other groups. I do recall reading that one of uh, Darby's followers, uh, the one who I think preserved his writings uh, and acted as his personal secretary, uh, regarded him as a very saintly man throughout his life. I I think uh, the quote is, "I, I never met a man who was more like Jesus. There's no doubt he was a remarkable man. He, he was very energetic, very uh, original, very clever, very prolific, very industrious, very dedicated uh, to his purpose. But I'll give an example of how we could interpret things differently. One of the stories as well is about him appearing at a cabin of a, a young man in the Wicklow Hills or Dublin Mountains. Uh, and the man, is, he's 18 and he's dying. And uh, so then this great ascetic figure... Uh, John Nelson Darby uh, pleads with him. He asks him whether he's saved, and he, you know he, he's not. He's a, he's a, I think he's a Catholic, and you know he's, he's not saved. And then, and then John Nelson Darby, you know, explains to him what the uh, the true position is, and he's he's saved. It's, it's something like that. Is the story? So this is a great example of the ascetic man out in the hills saving the poor Irish peasants from hell. But imagine you're in that position. You're lying in the bed here. Now, life has been tough for you. As you're out in the mountains. You're marginalized. You're not entitled to partake in society in many sense. You're discriminated against. You, you, you have to pay 10% of your tithes to the, to the, the local church that he's, he, he has been a member of, part of that system. And then you're dying and you're saying to yourself, oh, well, at least I'll get out of here. And then, then this, this fella comes knocking on the door. And you're in there lying in your bed and you say, oh, what have I done to deserve this? And you, you just said, let me go. And the man comes in and he starts talking and he's part of the ascendancy. And you're saying, well, I'm 18 years old, I'm going to die, but maybe if I'm not nice to this fella, you know, the mother or the family will get, so, you know, persecuted in some sense, you know, because this is, these are the landowning class. So the story that's, that's fantastic example viewed from another perspective is, is not necessarily so. So you have all this hagiography, it's normal, but that haven't been said. So there's different interpretations. You have to look at it in the, the cultural context. And it's very, very easy to talk about saving people. And I, it, but it seems strange to me. It seems, it seems very idolatrous when you can come along with the Bible like a Schofield did and put your interpretations on top of what you claim is the word of God and, sa- and then pay more attention to that. Or put John Nelson's Dar- uh, Darby's view in front of what you claim is the word of God or put some individual who claims they have a direct channel to Jesus and God in front of what you claim is. So I'm not as taken with some of the stories. And although he was, they they described him, I think they, some people in America think that the Dublin mountains are like the Himalayas, you know, but the, the, they're only some, you know, they're they're really kind of modest hills that have been well worn over geological time. So uh, you can manage them quite easily. And although he was living in Wicklow, uh, and he was living an ascetic life, he could always knock at the door at Powers Court and be, you know, at the big house 
you know, and he was in an apparatus. So I wouldn't overstate it. But that having been said, he did travel the world. He did live with the the, the, the people, um, uh, and he did uh, project his his vision. So he is a remarkable figure. Uh, there's uh, and it will it will take a long time for people to to read the entirety of of his work. So I, I don't want to be saying uh, bad uh, things about it. But there is another stream, and and again, the uh, the matter with things, Ian McGilchrist. I see a very left brain focus in this issue. I, I see a very f- the focus on detail, on isolation, on decontextualized context. It's really it's really a model of uh, uh, of this system. So yes, he was a remarkable man. Uh, yes, he would have been saintly for loads of people. He was capable of bitter disputes with some of his friends. In fact, one of the the oldest member of the exclusive brethren was a guy called Cronin, who I think was a, a leader in homo- homeopathy later on. He went to, to, to England uh, and he th- th- they met in, in Dublin and they fell out at the end uh, over, over doctrine uh, as Darby had a habit of falling out with people over doctrine. And in the last two years of Cronin's life, he was kind of not excommunicated, but he wasn't allowed to participate because he had done something wrong. So he had these bitter uh, bitter uh, disputes now they can be magnified so i wouldn't put too much attention on them so saintly he is for many people but if you're if you're bringing if in spiritual terms we know and it, it is we look to the bible that you judge it by the fruits what are the fruits well the fruits in this context are this massive military industrial stri- strategy st- uh, strategic complex in the united states utilizing these things so that's not a good result. So saintly uh, maybe in some senses, but we have to take the whole package, I think. Now, we can't blame everyone for, for the, the consequence or how people utilize their ideas. We can't do that. I'm not saying that. So he was a remarkable man. He was certainly very religious. Uh, there's no question about that. There's uh, any allegation about him that there has been one or two, uh, but they, um, they haven't been sustained or it's, it's difficult to sustain them. Well, it does seem to me that uh, there is a tendency, I uh, read about it from viewers who comment about uh, what they call wokeness. That is, amongst people, particularly right wing leaning people, they think woke is a terrible thing. And I don't know what the word woke means to everybody, but to me, it means being awake to social injustice, trying to create a world that works for everybody, regardless of race, religion, sexual orientation or gender, and trying to uh, sustain the environment for future generations. And for a a large segment of the population, this is considered considered bad. And and I've always wondered, why is this so? And it seems to me that it it might have something to do with this rapture theology. If what you said was a description of what is called wokeism, well, then I would have to agree with you. But I don't think, from what I see, that that's what it refers to. I think wokeism refers to a very particular type of uh, manipulation of public opinion, not to the the broader context. It may refer to, it may when you're talking about certain groups, it certainly may do when we're talking about groups that are very fundamentalist. They may use it in a much broader context. But I mean, being woke then is not as bad as being an antichrist, is it? You know, so so, so the you know what I mean. It's it, it's it's part of their litany. If you're not in, if you're not exclusive, it was called the exclusive brethren for a good reason because they do see themselves so everyone outside this and this was why Alistair Crowley of course who come from a, a, a Plymouth Brethren background so he was his mother called him an antichrist so that's that, you know you create a self-fulfilling prophecy I, I, I think this kind of purity or a claim to purity produces opposite but in relation to wokeism um, it's it's a description of certain types of of, of policies for I'll give you an example what might be described as woke there is this tendency Two, and this this is where the paradox comes in in relation to the difficulties of particular phenomena. There is a tendency to pull down statues around Britain uh, of people who are associated with the slave trade, of people who are associated with the empire. Now, my suspicions are, are I have great suspicions about this. 
the suspicions I have are, one, it's like the cultural revolution, the idea that you destroy, you take away the memories of the symbols of things that are there. That, that's one element, which I, I don't like about. It's the same as what happened in, in 1917 and 18 uh, in Russia when they attacked the, the beautiful churches and all that. It's this, it's this iconoclasm against what's there. So, so that's the danger when destroying things. But there's a second paradoxical element of it. And the paradoxical element is what these off, you know, supposedly left-wing people are doing are removing evidence of the imperial connection with the slave trade. So where we had an example and a whole range of statues of people that we could say useful in our history and using good sources, that, that this shows the connection between this place and the slave trade. Now that connection is gone and we can, that facilitates the opposite story. In many senses, it's like, it's like in that film, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but, uh, Pulp Fiction, where uh, with Tarantino, where they get the Mr. Wolf to clean the car. I think some of these organizations are doing the dirty work of the imperial systems because they don't understand the total historical context. So some of these things, which purport to be or are seen to be virtue signaling, are a deeper orchestration of public of public reality. That, that's what now. That's totally distinct from, or that, that that there has been a terrible kind of virtue signaling uh, in many sense, or the critique of virtue sig- signaling of using particular uh, issues to, you know, to to concentrate on, and in many senses, I think the reasonable element, as opposed to taking an extreme element, sees this as a distraction, a concentration of attention away from those issues, away from the bigger issues. Because when you're talking about some of these issues, about what someone said 20 years ago, uh, then you're not talking about the bigger issues. You're not talking about what's going on with international corporations or wars in other places or corporations. So in many senses, this narrow sense of wokeism can support the idea. I, I really don't think it's about it's about genuine issues about genuine issues of justice and again there are distinctions because we have to remember as well all these things are manipulated there's a big game going on so i don't see i don't uh, if, it, if it's that general critique of environmentalism uh, i i would support that wokeism but i don't believe it's that i, I believe that there that some of the critique is a critique of that narrow center of, of it I'm sure the issue gets very complex, actually. I know some of the people uh, I have heard of uh, who want to pull down statues because they don't want the statue up there as a, a symbol of things we admire. But they're not saying we should destroy the statue. They're saying, let's put this statue in a museum so that we can remember this part of our history, but let's not honor it. That's fair enough. That, that, that's a, a, an important distinction that you made, you made there. But uh, I'm, I'm getting a bit worried that uh, I'm getting a bit worried about that other use, but you, you, you have identified a very, very uh, sound use of it, if, if it could be. And I, I, and I think, um, like J- John Nelson Starby's mother, for example, was Vaughan, and, and her family were linked to uh, this, the, the, the slave trade in the West Indies. So he's directly from this context. So again, there is this, there is this uh, connection with that. I have no problem, and, and that's why history is fantastic for but I, I do get a bit worried that whereas I used to be able to, in certain places, some of these things that that contextualize places, that link them to places. For example, in Dockland, they pulled down some statue, and I think it was with the support of local politicians in uh, in East London, which was associated with the Docklands, which is a very interesting area that we've talked about before, and that was also associated with the slave trade. I think it's good that people can contextualize, see the connections, and, and people are more aware of the historical context and see also how these people were celebrated in that context and how there was pride in these imperial systems. Because I think it's important for people to, to know about empire because it's what was preoccupying the people at the time of Jesus. It was what was preoccupying the issues around the British Empire in, in this year with Nelson Darby. 
And in my view, it's what's preoccupying us now, because as I've said many times, I believe that we're living in an empire of scientism, and, and that that's that's what, uh, including biblical scientism, uh, in in that, because they often criticise the things. But I think there's that scientism in in the Bible, and that there's there are better theologians, more persuasive, who can. Uh, for example, make those arguments, who are aware of the social issues, who do make the social issues. In fact, Barbara Rooning is an example of, of the, a Lutheran who critiques uh, Nelson Darby and explains that it's because of uh, the lack of attention to the environment. And they, they talk about spirit in a lot of this, the Holy Spirit, but you don't see, sometimes you don't always see it. Uh, and I, I, I'm not making a broad brush thing about Protestantism beyond that, because of course a lot of Protestant groups are very socially active. So I, I don't want to tar everyone with the same brush in that. But this particular particular element, and uh, it is important, uh, as she said and others say, to look at the hopeful element. She stresses the hopeful element, contextualizes what the Book of Revelations is about, and focuses on on hope. So I, I would agree with that. And one last point on that is Swedenborg kind of anticipated some of these issues he was kind of indicating dispensations and he was uh, talking about the second coming and he saw this as a spiritual influx into the world that the second coming of jesus was about a spiritual influx and and, and it's, it's it's not dissimilar to what i would think would be necessary whatever background or whether it be buddhist or whatever the idea of a spiritual evolution to combat this because we're not going to 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 to, to, to solve it in existing ter- in the existing paradigm and also again the idea of focusing on the body the body being taken away it's a very kind of material sense it kind of doesn't look at the spiritual element of it and i think that's part of the left brain over literal literalistic view uh, of the bible that doesn't see because jesus in, in, in my book fits in and consistent with the perennial fol- philosophy is a force in history it's not a collection of words. It's not something that I can shout at you uh, on, from a stage to make you afraid. It's a spiritual force that we have, which is behind all that thing and often not behind this fear induction. It's a spiritual creative uh, force, which is, is liberating in, in that sense and is, is, is opposed to uh, those forces. And from there, the social justice movements happened in, 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 in the... The, the movement against slavery from the Protestant group, the Quakers are the great examples of, of, of groups motivated by a very similar philosophy, a very flat organization, a very similar ecclesiology, motivated by individuals who took a message and then applied it in social context in a whole range, whether better empl- treatment of employees, uh, conscientious objection, better business practices, protecting the environment. They're examples of a very, very positive way or in the, in the Lutheran churches as well so it doesn't have to go that way but being pragmatic come back to as, as William James talked about and those about what is the consequence of this view the consequences of the rapture in my view are disastrous and they're disastrous for Christianity and I think ultimately uh, they will destroy Christianity as we know it Well, very powerful words, James. And once again, a very enlightening conversation. I'm delighted to be back with you again and to share these thoughts with our audience. I think we're touching on crucial issues. So thank you so much for being with me today. Uh, Thanks, Jeffrey. It's always a pleasure to continue the conversation. And uh, I look forward to our next one. And thanks thanks for uh, listening to me patiently. And I hope I didn't rabbit on too long. (laughs) <laughs> no, you didn't bang on for too long. I'm uh, very happy to listen to you. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. 